Okay, so um, welcome everyone to today's Be Well Education session. My name is Mariah Bruner. I am UCA's wellness coordinator, so I serve faculty and staff. Um, I wanted to just take a moment to let Be Well participants know that you can earn five lifestyle rewards for attending today's session, and I will share how to do that at the end of the session. So just stick around to the end for that. Um, I'm also wanting to just take a, a moment to give a special shout out to Lacey Lyons in the College of Business. She was actually the one that suggested um, this topic and I thought it was a great idea um, and so excited to have um, Dr. Landry here with us today. And so I'll just go ahead and, and introduce Dr. Landry. So Dr. Landry is an associate professor here at UCA in Nutrition and Family Sciences. Um, she has lots of knowledge on this topic and she's really excited to share with us today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to her. Thank you, Alicia, for being here. Thank you. Thanks for the intro. Um, so excited to talk about this. And when the topic came up, I was like, yes, I've just been researching this. It's such a timely thing to be talking about and really, really fascinating. So uh, if I, I timed myself earlier and I'm going to try my best <laughs> to be very timely about this. So uh, our objectives for today, we're going to identify differences in like just the terminology about food allergy sensitivities and intolerances. We're going to talk about the different types of testing that's available for food allergies and then think about nutrition therapy options. You know, what's the role of a registered dietitian in all of this? And so coincidentally, and I actually did not think about this, Mariah, we planned this perfectly. Uh, this May is Food Allergy Awareness Month, and last week was actually Food Allergy Awareness Week, so very cool timing. And before we get started, just a disclaimer that I am not a physician, and I cannot give you medical advice. My job is to talk to you, and educate, and provide information so that you can make evidence-based decisions and use this information to talk to a care provider in case you need help with your food allergy management. So it definitely does not replace you talking to your primary care um, provider. So the, oh, wait a second. I'm not moving my slides forward. There we go. Okay. I'm not gonna start over. <laughs> um, okay. So let's see my disclaimer there. And then these are some of the ads that I could find related to food allergy testing, food sensitivity. And so if any of these look familiar, that's what we're gonna be addressing today. It's interesting to look at the different costs that are there. And then uh, here's another option. It's a breath test and it's $179 to do that. So there are reasons why you might want something like this, but we're gonna go through and really talk about you using, those, using that money and um, the cost that's associated with it. So another couple of screenshots here. And just looking at um, the cost, he, I mean, 259 it's on sale for $169. If you just Google search um, food allergy testing, food sensitivity testing, thousands of uh, sites pop up. Did you get a lot of different hits for that? those search words, key terms? So it is very timely, interesting. And, you know, a lot of insurance, health insurance, companies don't pay for things like that. And so that's one thing that we're going to talk about too. So just the groundwork, there's different terminology that's involved and hypersensitivity or allergy is one of the words that you might hear. And so it's just enhanced sensitivity to a stimulus and it could be pollen, grass, or a food. And then with the epidemiology of it, over 50 million Americans have an allergic disease, and it's the sixth largest leading cause of um, ER visit or emergency room visits. And so it could, and this is, we're just talking about allergic disease, so not necessarily food, but allergies are a very prevalent topic. And, um, you know, there's differences between pediatric allergies and adult allergies, and we'll talk about that a little bit. 
more, uh, we'll also talk about the immunoglobin response. So if you see IgG or IgE, the immunoglobin is what happens in your body when uh, you're exposed, the area is the, what's produced when you're exposed to a stimulus. And so you can have immunoglobin A, immunoglobin B. So the ones that are specific that we're going to talk about with food are IgE and IgG. And so just a, another fact here, the incidence of food allergy in children under the age of 18 has increased uh, by about 18% over the past 10 years. And so one of the things that we really kind of fall back on when, we, when we're thinking about why have food allergies increased so dramatically and uh, some scientists say it's be, that they uh, talk about the hygiene theory and that we aren't as exposed to allergens as much as we were in the past. And so some Israeli studies have looked at feeding infants high amounts of peanuts and seeing how they are allergic over time. And so in the U.S. for a long time, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended absolutely no peanuts before a child was two years of age. And so they've come back a little bit on that and there's new revised recommendations based on some of the findings that have come out. So a food allergy is an immunological response. It's some abnormal response that your body has to a food. A food intolerance or a food sensitivity, we're going to use intoler food intolerance and sensitivity interchangeably. And that's an abnormal reaction that is not immune mediated. So that might be something like lactose. Um, you're, if you're intolerant to lactose because you don't have the lactase enzyme to break down lactose, <clears throat> excuse me, that's in milk. So there is no standard food sensitivity definition, medical definition. And so it is, you know, it's kind of like when we think about what are natural foods, we don't really have a definition for natural we don't have a definition for food intolerance or food sensitivity. An intolerance occurs when you're not able to digest a certain component of a food. So this is where I get really nerdy because this is some of the things that we talk about in food science. So lactose, you don't digest lactose because you have a lactase deficiency. So you can buy lactate milk that um, has enzyme that's already broken down. You can take oral enzymes. There's things that you can do to help your body break down the lactose, the sugar that's in milk. With tuna and mackerel, they actually contain histamines. And so if you eat large amounts of those items, then your body can have a histamine response because those foods naturally have histamine in them. And it's just fascinating that it's a naturally occurring thing. Yellow dye five, monosodium glutamate or MSG, different sulfites and lead are all things that people are very intolerant to. So you think like MSG can give people headaches, flushing, uh, they, you know, they turn red, their ears and their face can turn red, and really a lot of gastrointestinal upset. It's so they, these different food components, especially in the volume of processed foods that we have, that we consume, can lead to intolerances. And with intolerances, abdominal cramping, diarrhea, bloating, and constipation are all symptoms of the intolerance. So when we're thinking about food sensitivity tests, these look for IgG because it's not the same immune response as that you're, it's not an immune response so you're not looking at IgE so IgE the immunoglobin E is a very short-term reaction so it happens within minutes to like two hours whereas IgG is longer and it can take weeks to have a response and so you build up this immunoglobin G over time and so it's not really the tests that we have really aren't specific to so to let you know if someone is truly sensitive to the food. It could just be that that um, immunoglobin has built up in their system because they're eating that food. So it could, if you're testing, if you're using these tests 
to look for a food intolerance or sen sensitivity. It could lead to unnecessary avoidance of foods, which can be very costly and it can affect your nutrition status. So it, now we're going to transition to actual food allergy. So with IgE, food allergy, uh, your IgE is, re, is produced in response to a protein that crosses the gastrointestinal lining. And it could also happen if, for example, you're, well, so my, an example, I'm really allergic to jalapenos. And so even when, it, like I can wear gloves, when I cut jalapenos, but then if I like rub my eye or touch my nose, then I have an allergic response. And so uh, when it enters your body, so the major way that food enters is through the gastrointestinal lining. And what's interesting about that is that uh, when we, we sometimes assume that when we cook food that we denature the protein. So, uh, in some ways, logic, you would think that, okay, if I'm allergic to eggs, eggs are, have a lot of protein. So if I'm allergic to the egg protein, I cook the egg, it's going to denature the protein. So the protein doesn't exist in the same form that it did that I was originally allergic to. So I should be able to eat cooked eggs or I should be able to eat eggs in cakes. And that's not the way that it works sometimes because the proteins might not be broken down completely when they're cooked um, to the sequence that it needs to be to be different. It might be that they're not broken down uh, well enough by the acid in your stomach or even the enzymes that are in your body. And so there can be, we can't just assume that cooking something or our body's going to take care of eliminating the protein reaction. So when we have a food allergy or a food allergic reaction. You can have hives, itching, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, trouble breathing. One thing that really confuses people sometimes is that you can have uterine cramps. And so in females, that's a very odd feeling. And then it's related to a food allergy. Um, so I think one of probably the most, maybe the least Fewer common responses, but maybe the most well-known would be like a respiratory, so the anaphylax where you can't breathe. And I think of Hitch, the movie Hitch, when he eats like shellfish and his face blows up and uh, he can't talk. And so that, you know, an automatic a response to some food that you've eaten. So in pediatrics, so in kids, the most common offenders are peanuts milk, shellfish, and so this chart just shows you um, the rates of the, or the percent of the population of pediatrics that are alert, food allergic, and this is um, showing the rate that's actually diagnosed versus uh, convincing, which means that it hasn't been diagnosed, but it presents as if it is an allergy. And then with adult offenders, actually shellfish is the places switch the Names are the same, but the uh, position switch and uh, milk and then peanuts. And so peanuts, again, are one of those things that we we've shown that, you know, you can start out with peanut powder and increase the dose of the peanut that you're getting. And in some people eventually get rid of or not get rid of, but manage a peanut allergy so that you don't have an anaphylactic response. So I love a good algorithm, and I know this might be kind of small on your screen, but when you know, the um, slides will be uh, given out. So, you know, thinking through, OK, what does it look like if I think that I have a food allergy? And so, you know, if you're reacting to some food, think, is it a sensitivity or is it an allergy? And then if, you know, you want to go further, this is how it works like this is the protocol for allergy so you have a history and a physical exam with an allergist or immunologist and then they're going to do different types of tests and so we're going to get into some testing so if you're testing for food allergies you're going to have 
um, either a skin prick test, and so that's what's on the screen is an example of a skin prick test. And I think maybe one of the reasons that I'm so interested in allergy is because I've been allergic my whole life. I can remember as a kid going to the allergist and it was a full day and a half of skin pricks and they did your entire arm and your back and your other arm and your back. And you would just stay there all day and get to get pricked with these needles of different allergens. And it, I was allergic to very few foods, but basically my whole environment. So every grass there is. And I grew out of some of that and some I didn't and I still have. And so skin prick testing has been done for a very long time and it, it's done a little bit differently now, but it's still is way to test. And then the allergen specific IgE serum tests are another way to look at food allergy. And these would be like a blood draw. And so you're in your blood draw, it's going to look for specific pieces of protein or of IgE. So you would look for, you know, the top common ones like wheat, soy, eggs, milk. And so that, you know, you might be, what if you're allergic to cinnamon and that's not going to be on this specific serum test? So you wouldn't know. So the serum test I have to, they're very, very specific about what is tested for. Uh, the food elimination diet is another way to test for allergies. You usually start with a food diary and then you eliminate everything that could be causing a problem. And it takes a really long time because you're adding in, you, then you start to add foods back in. And it does need to be done under supervision. And so an oral food challenge is really the gold standard. And this is where you would go to a doctor's office, your allergist or immunologist, and you would stay and they would introduce you to little pieces of food throughout the visit and, to, and look at your reaction. And the reason why it has to be done in a clinic is because if they give you something and you have an anaphylactic response, they would be able to treat you there. And so these are just again images of the different types, the skin prick, the blood test, and the food elimination diet. And so your oral food challenge, what do you expect? You expect, so you will have to get off of any allergy medications, asthma medications for like two weeks before you go in for a food challenge. And you would plan to be at the physician's office for a day, maybe more, depending on what they want to test for. And so the challenge is that every cert whatever certain interval amount of time that they prescribe is when they would bring a new food for you to try and see what your reaction is. Do you have hives? Is it cramping? And so this is where you're looking for those IgE responses because it's the short term response. So how do you prepare for that? You stop taking your allergy medications and you have to uh, you'll they'll be giving you a very standard bland um, kind of a hypoallergenic diet to be on so that when you go into the clinic, it's easier for them to see some of those reactions that you might have. So foods that are typically challenged are those main offenders like dairy. Um, they'll do heated dairy, like milk, cow's milk. And so they'll do uh, heated milk to see if you, because some people are allergic to uh, fresh milk, but not heated milk, just the same example with eggs. And so they would do different versions of that. Um, baked eggs versus scrambled eggs because the temperature is different. So it denatures the protein differently. Different grains and uh, wheat, rice, peanuts and different tree nuts, nut butters, and fish and shellfish. So non-standardized and unproven procedures. This is one of my favorite slides in the whole thing because there is a huge list of things that are sold to a consumer on Google. And what you're seeing in those Facebook ads and Instagram ads, and these are not they're not standardized and they're not proven, so they're not covered by insurance typically, and they're pretty expensive. And not all of it can be done just mail a kit 
you do an oral swab or draw blood and send it back. So some of this is pretty invasive stuff. The gastric juice analysis is one that I find interesting because they actually put a tube down your nose and into your stomach and aspirate your gastric juice and then test it for what's in it. I'm like, Egg McMuffin, <laughs> please. Um, anyway, so the diagnosis and treatment Avoidance is really, once it's diagnosed, once you have an allergy that's diagnosed, um, your treatment is to avoid that food or that allergen. There are some medications like corticosteroids, bronchodilators that you can use depending on the response that you have to the specific allergen, but there's no FDA approved medical treatment, and that's say for food allergies. Um, so, you know, we you have like allergies, for example, to pollens or um, dog, cat dander, things like that, you can do allergy shots. And for food allergies, that th those are not FDA approved. So things that are being researched that are in clinical trials are oral immunotherapy, sublingual immunotherapy. So the so oral immunotherapy would be like testing or taking amounts of peanut powder every day and gradually increasing the amount until you're not having a immune response anymore. And then the epicutaneous um, immunotherapy would be allergy shots. So the role of the dietitian in all of this the, you know, you would want to read, you know, if you think you have an allergy or sensitivity, you want to find a provider that can do legitimate testing for you. And then you want to make sure that there's an interprofessional team working the, your provider with a dietitian. And the dietitian's job in this case is to make sure that it's patient specific because every person's allergy and their response to allergies is going to be different. And we also have to consider food and nutrition literacy, the level. So I always, my husband, he always gets used as an example because we did find a lot of food allergies for him through a blood specific, um, or the specific IgE testing. And it was eggs, peanuts, dairy, um, wheat. And, but it doesn't mean that we eliminate those things from his diet, because if we did, he would eat potatoes. You know. So what we have to do is figure out where's the threshold so he can eat small amounts of eggs and dairy and wheat, but not like a huge bowl of pasta with a milk-based cream sauce and butter. It, so you work with your dietitian to figure out what is doable for you and what's manageable for your symptoms. And also, especially with pediatrics, the cross contact and contamination. And so if you are severely allergic to something and you are in school and you're eating in a cafeteria and the person beside you has a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you're allergic to peanut butter, what do you do with that? And a lot of that is worked through with the dietitian, the dietitian at a school district and the school nutrition managers and directors. And so again, having a team approach is very helpful. So the dietitian also needs to help meet nutrition needs within elimination diets. And so you can have different ways of being exposed. So that dietitian is going to work on a meal plan, but also teaching you how to avoid cross-contamination, how to ask for accommodations at restaurants, how to contact food manufacturers in case the labeling isn't clear, skills that you need to have to read food labels, and then understanding what labeling laws are. And so I said, you know, what if you're allergic to cinnamon? I kind of off the cuff a minute ago, but I once had a student who was severely allergic to cinnamon. And so usually cinnamon is one of those ingredients that's not listed on an ingredient label because it doesn't have to be if it's less than a certain amount or a certain percentage of what's in the food. And so you would have to be very careful about what you were consuming and going back to scratch cooking a lot because you don't always know what is cross-contaminated in food processing factories. And then also the role of the dietitian would be to reinforce what it means to be safe with your allergies. And especially if you have EpiPens or other um, ep like epinephrine injections or bronchodilators 
when it's time to use those. So myths, conceptions, and myths. Food allergies are very serious. So these are not true statements on this slide. Um, eating a little bit won't hurt. It depends on your threshold. And not every allergic reaction gets worse and worse. Sometimes the more you're exposed to it, the less reactivity you have. So allergies and intolerances are not the same. Um, peanut isn't necessarily the most dangerous food allergy because I've seen shellfish be a lot more dangerous, just not as prevalent. Not all allergy inducing things have to be listed on food labels. It depends on the proportion of it in that food. And um, if you, you can't assume that just because you had a breath test or a blood test or one of those ones that's advertised that you pay for personally, that it's going, just because it says you weren't positive doesn't mean that you're not allergic. And if you do develop a food allergy in a childhood, it doesn't mean that you're always stuck with it. You can outgrow those. But just because you don't have it when, a child, when you're a child doesn't mean that you can't develop it later. So what's mind blowing to me about food allergies is that these are some of the things that can reduce the rate of allergy or food allergic items in people. So if you grew up with multiple children in your household, uh, growing up in rural areas and living like like working and living on a farm, the country life is what I said. Um, if your mom had a vaginal delivery of you as a baby and what your gut microbiota is um, made of. So those five things really do influence how allergic people are. And the people that have, you know, you can just have one or two of these things, you know, maybe um, you lived, rural, you grew up in a rural area and you had multiple brothers and sisters. So just those two things can really reduce the rates of aller the allergens that you present with. Um, so just, I mean, it's kind of weird to think about the environmental things that can really play a, a part in food allergy. So specific to UCA employees, uh, within 20 miles, this is using the United Healthcare portal. Within 20 miles of UCA, there are 12 identified care providers in the network. Well, and I did not finish that sentence. <laughs> Sorry. Um, at least 12 identified care providers in the network who can test for food allergy. And within 50 miles, so I'm, you know, that's the medical center in Little Rock area. There's 26 identified providers who are board certified in allergy and immunology and are in network for UHC, which would typically mean that that lower copay. So I think, you know, my driving home point here is that you want to make sure that the person that you're going to to see about your food allergy or sensitivity it is a board certified in allergy allergist or immunologist that's important and so if you go to your primary care provider you can ask for referrals and ask them you know have that conversation do you manage this or can you refer me to an allergist because they are available and 20 the 26 here that i found were accepting patients and so it is something that we're aware of the food allergies that, uh, you know, they need to be addressed and that they're becoming more and more common. So I have uh, some resources here for you if you want to learn some more information and then some references for you. Um, so another thing that I want to, I'm going to stop sharing real quick. Um, wanted to send out with the slides is a brief survey about it's something that like a registered dietitian would use um, to ask about your food allergies and how to manage that so okay 1230 you did it you did it let me share my screen thank you alicia let me share my screen um, as we wrap up so that you all can see how to claim your lifestyle reward points um hold on there's always that awkward pause here just a moment Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. We'll get there. Hold on a second. 
Dun, 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 dun. There we go. Um, you can just take a picture of this screen here um, and load it up to your portal to get your five points. Um, also, since I'm going to be emailing you the slides and the survey uh, tool that Alicia mentioned, I will also go ahead and email a PDF copy of this certificate as well. So whatever's easiest for you, if you want to grab a screen grab now, I'll leave this up, um, but you'll also get an email from me later today. Um, I'm going to officially adjourn, but I would like to open it up for any questions. Um, I'm sure Alicia can stay on for a few moments. That was a lot of information, but really, really good. I learned many new things, so I appreciated this session. Um, so yes, we will we'll adjourn, but please do stay on and we can take questions. You know, I always have a question, Alicia. Hey, Tara. We, we talked about this before. Um, and I have had the, the blood sensitivity testing years ago. Um, and mine is really weird because it has to do with the fibromyalgia that I have and, and Sjogren's and other stuff. So, but I've run fever. So the foods cause me to